<laughs> that's an editing trick. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So now when I need to know to go back and get rid of this, I'll just look for the, the spike in the sound. Oh, okay. Right? Oh, clap right. it to the mic yeah. and it creates one spike. Oh, okay. See that? That's what I, I thought I you were trying thought... to do a, hit, a clap or Yeah, no. <laughs> clap, <laughs> or, <what the> <laughs> yeah. clap, man. Shit. <laughs> 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 oh. All right, we were good. <clears throat> Not I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I come back in hot. I, I come back in hot like an eight-year-old lady, clapping <laughs> off her <laughs> lamp. That's how I come in. That was my hip snapping. Hey, what are you doing over there, you cocksucker? You're dying laughing. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh all shut. I'm going to get this reason. shit back on the rails. <laughs> oh, go ahead, man. Go ahead. I am the talent. It's fucking funny, man. You have to keep clapping into the fucking microphone like a maniac. <laughs> these motherfuckers are beating me up the whole fucking time. <laughs> Just trying to get this shit going. Clapping in, clapping out, <laughs> clapping in, clapping out. <laughs> Dude, I get bitched it by you if I don't fucking go and take shit out of the fucking program. Uh, it's fucking damaged goods. Yeah. Okay, okay. It's the yeah. only show that you can clap on. <laughs> the only show you can get the clap on. <laughs> Boom. Damaged goods. All right, everybody. Welcome back to take two for this episode of the Baked and Awake podcast. This is your host, Steve, and we are going to go right ahead and replicate the content from the episode which I published just a day ago, yesterday, of which I am less than proud in terms of the final product, listenability, and the voice versus music level competition. Uh, So because of that, what we are doing today is we are acting like somebody who knows how to produce his own podcast, and I have brought in the audio tracks into a separate track, mixed them all down into one single track that I'll have the ability to manage the playback volume on quite a bit easier so without further ado we're going to jump right back into how we did this yesterday and do my usual opening comments i like to let new listeners come into the podcast for the first time know first off you are most welcome thank you for being here thank you for spending any of your precious time in this busy busy world of ours and your busy and important lives with me and with any of us here at the Baked and Awake podcast. Usually just me, but we have some guests from time to time, some helpful co-hosts from time to time, friends who come through. So we don't want to forget them. We appreciate them too, and they add a lot when they do come through and take part. We also smoke weed on this show. The show's called Baked and Awake. Should have been your first clue. I record here in Seattle, Washington, in the heart of the Pacific Northwest's legal cannabis industry, Greenbelt, one of the first and biggest legal markets in the country. And uh, I also work in the local industry, work for a cannabis garden, a Tier 3 I-502 a legal cannabis garden called Weed Plus Tacoma. So I serve as the director of sales for that company. So it's kind of why I like to chop it up about cannabis as much as I do. So, you know, keep that in mind. If you're working at a, you know, office environment where maybe some explicit talk about cannabis, not that there's going to be a ton of it, this particular episode uh, might be on the docket. That might be something to put your earbuds in for, or maybe wait for your drive home. Uh, I want to let you know where you can find the show. You can always find Baked and Awake on all your favorite podcatchers. For those of you who might be, for whatever reason, discovering the podcast for the first time and coming at it through your desktop, you can always visit me at bakedandawake.com. All episodes are streamable right through a portal there. You'll also find some 
Additional notes and information about the podcast there at the website. In addition to at my own standalone domain, you can find the Baked and Wake podcast in very good company over at damagedgoodsinc.com, the small independent network that I am a proud member of. I am joined over there by a number of other wonderful and very different podcasts from my own. Uh, Foremost among them is the show for whom the network takes their name, the Damaged Goods Podcast. Damaged Goods the show. Uh, They get up to all sorts of hijinks (laughs) over there. Uh, It's Usually kind of a roasty situation over there as well. Not to say in the smoking uh, vernacular, but more like your personality, persona, and ego may find itself getting roasted (laughs) at any given moment, even vicariously through the guests. So plenty of debauchery to be found there. Also, uh, the very wonderful Daddy Issues hosted by Lily Bongwater and the Shade Queen, where they get down and talk relationships and the world from the women's point of view uh needless to say another great show social commentary jokes pop culture you name it from the boys over it needless to say finally there's clay time in the basement with my boy clay miles crazy person uh also hollers about well what's going on in the world around us every day and he does so from his basement where he gets hyped and lets you know what time it is. So, uh, and that's just scratching, barely scratching the surface of what goes on over at the Damaged Goods Network. So check them out. Say hello. Let them know Steve sent you. I'm sure they'll be very happy to meet you over there. Uh, I also don't want to neglect to mention and thank my Patreon supporters, uh, including our newest Patreon supporter, the very wonderful Bones and Tubs podcast. Uh, The boys over at Bones and Tubs are unfailingly informative as well as challenging. And by that I mean they go right into the deep end of the esoteric, occult, conspiracy, paranormal pool, a lot like I tend to at times. Uh, They do a great job working off of one another. They both come to the table every week prepared, ready to talk about the topic, having done some research, having formulated some cogent thoughts on what they're getting after. These boys are very different from me politically, so that's where a lot of times the challenge aspect comes in. And it's a great opportunity for me as like a weird, always dynamic, forever evolving, ask me at two different times a day and you're going to get two different answers, um, like super progressive, weird lefty who also somehow has anarchist tendencies, so what the fuck um you know these guys are definitely they're they're in ohio first off they're coming at it with a little bit more of a you know i'll say it a bit more of like a libertarian kind of slant uh to some of their rhetoric and some of their thoughts and impressions but don't let me pigeonhole them okay because they're far from your textbook vanilla uh unthinking uh, we like weed, but fuck poor people, libertarians. Okay, they are not those dudes. Bones and Tubs podcast. I love you guys. Thank you for your support. Thank you for putting your money where your mouth is. Just like Bones and Tubs, you guys, if you like the podcast and you want to participate in the Patreon community where you have a lot of direct access to me, where in time I hope to post bonus content for the podcast. We never want to put most of this podcast at all behind anything resembling a paywall. It's not about that. This is about sharing information, putting out positive content, and keeping it accessible. So the Patreon side isn't going to unlock hundreds of secret shows for you, okay, that I'm never going to share with the general public. We're not doing that as a community here at Baked in Awake, right? But the hope is that If you like what I'm doing and you want to fuck around and support this podcast, you can do so for like a little over the price of a gram of weed at the rec shop or a round of drinks at the bar. A buck a month, $12 a year, and you can support the podcast for 
12 months and really just put a spring in my step, help me start that little piggy bank for the podcast, for future projects, for field trips, for improvements, for research materials, you name it. Whatever resources we're able to bring in from something like the Patreon community will all be directly reinvested into continuing to produce the show and always to raising the bar of quality. So I think you can find that at patreon.com forward slash baked and awake. And I think that's all you need to know about that for right now, right? We never try to spend too much time on that, but we appreciate our supporters. We appreciate supporters like my boys over at Top Tree Digital, one of the funniest accounts on Instagram. If you like weed humor like me, if you like memes like me, and especially because one of the my favorite things about Top Tree is honestly they're pretty wholesome. They don't get too nasty with their memes ever. And frankly, I, I find that refreshing because they're unfailingly funny. Check them out. They're a strong supporter of the show. I'm looking forward to doing some collaborations with them in the future and can't wait to see what shape those take. Um, everybody who I just mentioned, including the Patreon link and the Damaged Goods Network and Bones and Tubs, everybody's going to be in the show notes. You know me and my show notes. All right. Um, I also want to thank, before we get into the content, uh, the topic of the day today, the Nag Hammadi Library, I want to thank a couple other people. I want to thank my friends at the Blue Pearl Animal Hospital, a um, local animal hospital who recently took care of our beautiful, wonderful, friendly, and uh, loved, but all too short-lived pet parakeet, CeeLo. I know, go ahead, laugh. Yeah, I'm talking about a pet parakeet. He was a wonderful little buddy. And uh, he sadly took ill just a couple weeks after we got him. And in the course of a few short hours, uh, went downhill so fast that I had to take him to the emergency hospital. They took wonderful care of CeeLo. And then even though we lost him, they held on to him for a day for me so that I could go pick up his little body and bring him home for our own little sort of memorial service. Uh, took over $200 off their original estimate for care for him um, as well in the process. So uh, we were touched by their kindness and their compassion for our little birdie. They've helped us with some of our other pets in the past as well. And I just wanted to say thanks just in case any of the folks from Blue Pearl ever hear this podcast. Thank you very much, you guys. It was, it was a rough day, but you folks made it easier. Uh, finally, a uh, quick thanks to my friend Josh Kincaid uh, from the local cannabis community here, uh, Super Chronic Josh on Instagram. I'll link him in the show notes. He got me in the door at a really cool um, like startup pitch event uh, here for the cannabis industry uh, in downtown Seattle a couple weeks back on September 24th. I was able to attend the International Business Exchange Seattle edition, and it was put on by uh, a local Seattle sort of uh, angel investor fund uh, called the Flora Fund. And uh, they had keynote speaker there who talked about the industry in general and where it's going in the future. Uh, several local companies all pitched very compelling and unique products to uh, potential investors at the event. And I'm not going to get specific about that uh, too much other than to say uh, I hope definitely that it was uh, productive and a great opportunity for everyone particularly my friend jerry and the uh, friends over at soro software a probably the top cannabis crm uh, you know cannabis industry oriented crm solution that is out on the market today um, and uh, jerry gave a great presentation he's got a great product and i know they're going places so i'll, I'll, I'll mention them just because that's my buddy right there so um and yeah, so it was, you know, a great, great event uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I was glad to go to it. I don't think I would have found out about it at all if it hadn't been for my friend Josh. And I learned a lot that day. I was able to also ask a bunch of questions. They had an open panel discussion with a couple of industry lawyers. And I asked a number of, you know, general interest, interest questions to me that I can't answer for myself that, you know, you guys don't need to worry about right now. It's just stuff that informs my general, you know, mindset and, and picture of what's going on around here right now but uh 
You know, that's unprecedented access to talk to a couple of attorneys who do nothing but deal with license holders here in our state and in, in states around the country in different legal markets uh, and to get their take on a few different things. So, uh, Josh, good luck, brother. Thank you once again for inviting me and hope to attend some events with you in the future as well. All right. I think it's just about time to smoke some weed, you guys. What do you think? I think we should. Let's do it. Um, so, yeah. Same as yesterday, which it's hopefully going to be today for most of you. Although, I'm both happy and sad that over 100 people already listened to or at least downloaded that train wreck of a recording from yesterday. Hope a few of you actually come back and try to hear this version um, and sit through it one more time just for the sake of hearing what it hopefully should have sounded like in the first place. But just like yesterday, I'm smoking some early flowers that were taken like in the housekeeping process off of my backyard medical uh, plants. Um, so these are, you know, um, quick dried. I mean, I did everything bad with these. These We took them early, but I was cleaning up my plants and making, you know, airspace in there and just, you know, uh, trying to set the plants up for the main colas to get the remaining energy for the last few weeks of the flower season. But uh, I'll tell you a little secret that, you know, every fucking fancy would-be fucking weed aficionado on the internet uh, would like to probably lambast me for, but uh, did you know that you can take your shit that you just harvested, and if you need to, if you want to, if you want to get a little preview of what your flower is going to be like, you go grab that food dehydrator that your wife uses for strawberries and banana chips and stuff, and you take that baby, you set it up, you plug it in, you take those little early nugs you got, and you lay them out all inside that food dehydrator, and you turn it on low, low, low. And then you let it go. 24 hours, 36, 48 is probably a little too long, honestly. Um, you come back the next day, pull those babies out, give them a squeeze. If they feel good. It's all right. You're not selling that anyway. It's just your stuff. It's just your medicine. You're in your own house. Nobody's judging you. Nobody's looking at you. I'm here to tell you, this stuff doesn't smoke half bad. And it gets me not only excited for the real harvest day, but if anything, lets me be a little bit more patient to let those babies out back go an extra few days because I'm not chomping at the bit and I haven't not tasted the fruits of my labors. Something to think about. Uh, so this strain is Lake of Fire, which is the Cobain Kush and GG4 cross uh, that I've had for a couple seasons now. And these are some of the first tastes that I'm getting of it for this year. So stoked about it. I think this one giant one from Randy's Wired will hopefully get us through. All right, so what we've got today, I mentioned this the last couple of episodes, I was building up to it, wanted to spend some time introducing us to some esoteric, biblical, apocryphal texts called the Nag Hammadi Scriptures. These are books that were, uh, when I say books, I mean papyrus codexes, which were like a proto-book type format not a scroll, for example, okay, um, but it, it sort of looked like a rectangle, like a book, uh, that were discovered in Upper Egypt, in an area formerly known as Nag Hammadi. They have a modern name for the city now, which we'll get into in the Wikipedia um, entry uh, that we'll use to get a little bit more background on this, but they were found back in the mid-40s, right after World War II, and uh, kind of took a while to make their way from the village where they were discovered in to the light of day and to academia and today to the rest of the world. So um, in the terms of, you know, the, the realm of texts that modern academics and in particular like biblical scholars have to inform them on how the modern, you know, like our King James Bibles and things came about and came to be, um, 
these are amongst the most informative texts because these codices, codices, codexes, I think codices, while only being discovered in 1946, actually date back to like the third or fourth century common era. And that would place them only a couple hundred years after the time when some of these codices, in particular one that we're going to dip into the beginnings of today, um, were said to originally have been written. All right, let's light this joint and we'll get into it. We're going to so this is, uh, you know, an area that I'm always interested in. I'm a armchair wannabe philosopher. The thing that I love about the Nag Hammadi Library, uh, to break it down for you really simply, is being a, like, self, you know, self-driven learner in my adulthood. I have no formal, you know, education on any of this. It's just an area of interest. But it's never gone away. It's always been there. I was raised Episcopal. Uh, left the church in my later teens, um, you know, mostly through a lot of questioning and a lot of, you know, tearful discussions with my mother, who, of course, being more devout um, than myself or really anybody in the family, um, you know, didn't, of course, want to see, you know, me cleave away from the church because naturally my brother would follow soon after, etc., on down the line, right? And, and that, you know, to a small extent occurred. But even though I have not attended church as a regular part of my life in my adult life, and I don't consider myself a practicing Christian or Episcopalian at all anymore, um, I am in love with studying and musing upon Western religion in general, Eastern belief systems, uh, in particular, like Zen Buddhism, Taoism, okay, Taoism even more so than Zen, uh, a little bit more approachable for me, and I spent a, a great number of years really reading the Tao, like, daily. Probably, I would have to admit, I've read the Tao much more completely and um, more times than any attempt at reading the Bible has ever gone for me. And I've read large chunks of the Bible, believe it or not. Uh, in my youth, I took a go at starting in Genesis and going all the way through. Um, I think I, in my first sitting, I made it through most of the Old Testament with a lot of skimming because there's literally whole chapters of just people's family lineage there in the Old Testament, as some of you might very well be very aware. Um and made it into like the first couple of books of the uh, New Testament before I probably tapered off that first time around. And, uh, you know, I've gone back a, a few times since then a lot more tactically to go through and read certain books. So, um, but, you know, not to act like I sit here and study this stuff week in and week out like that. Uh, these days it's a lot more, you know, watching documentaries, consuming podcasts and audiobooks on the topics, of course, right? Um, just like you, busy guy, so... It's a lot harder to sit down and read these days in 2018 than it, than it once was when I was growing up. That said, I've got an interest in this area. I'm hoping that those of you who are regular listeners of the pod are also would-be philosophers. I'm hoping to show you today, when we get into the actual beginning of one of the books that we're going to look at, that the big takeaway for me about the Nag Hammadi scriptures is that there's something here that is bigger than these texts alone. It feels older, it feels more universal, and it feels like knowledge that has been like baked into our humanity since forever, since before there was writing and civilization as we know it today, as we call it today um, a lot of the like passages that we will read remind me very much of passages that I have read and felt and understood in my you know heart and mind from in particular sources like 
the Tao, the Tao Te Ching. Um, I hope that after you listen to this episode and have heard, perhaps in the case of some of you for the first time, some of these verses that are part of these books, that you may also pick up on that vibe, that similarity. I still haven't managed to light my joint, by the way. I'm just holding it, waving it around in the air here. (laughs) Um, So what what I thought we'd do is we're going to start with the Wikipedia article because, hey, fuck you. You haven't read this either, okay? Correct me if I'm wrong. (laughs) So, And it's not a bad Wikipedia article. They have a great um, sort of background on what these texts are and we'll even go a little bit into the discovery story, although I may skim over that a little bit more lightly because that is, it's an interesting story. These texts have an incredible discovery story and it's covered really well in just about any you know, YouTube documentary or anything you care to bother to search up on your, on your computer to find. Um, and so you know, we're gonna focus briefly on what they are and where they came from and sort of where they ended up. Um, And then we're going to dip into one of the uh, codices and read a few passages out of it. So let's um, let's finally open the wiki and then we're going to finally light this dang joint. So these these scripts were written by people who were I believe understood to be the Gnostic sect at, at this time in history, um, a Gnostic sect of Christianity, which would have been, you know, a early Christian uh, sect that had sort of the, uh, I believe, a really early proto-Christianity that they practiced at this time. Okay, um, you know, all the things that are are, you know what we consider hallowed traditions today would have been brand spanking new if not even not even thought of yet at, at during this era um, the Gnostics of course uh, are well known for also sort of being associated with thoughts and things uh, like the hermetic principles uh, gnosis in general Gnosticism right um, these are terms we hear all the time. There we go. Banging our heads into the mic stand, smoking weed. All right. So, let's get into this Wikipedia article on the Nag Hammadi Library. The Nag Hammadi Library, also known as the Chenoboskion Manuscripts and the Gnostic Gospels, is a collection of early Christian and Gnostic texts discovered near the upper Egyptian town Nag Hammadi in 1945. 13 leather-bound papyrus codices buried in a sealed jar were found by a local farmer named Muhammad al-Saman. The writings in these codices comprised 52 mostly Gnostic treatises, but they also include three works belonging to the Corpus Hermeticum and a partial translation slash alteration of Plato's Republic. That codice gave uh, scholars some insight into both the transcription process and translation process that was at work on you know in the in the uh, well whether it was a monastery or a school or what have you that uh, these books were being translated at but in addition to the technical process they noticed intentional alterations of Plato's Republic so kind of a little bit of an insight into what happens with all these texts all these books down through the generations somebody messes with them along the lines somewhere some way every time I'm shrugging shrugging over here (laughs) in his introduction to the Nag Hammadi library in English 
James Robinson suggests that these codices may have belonged to a nearby Pacomian monastery and were buried after St. Athanasius condemned the use of non-canonical books in his Festal Letter of 367 AD. The discovery of these texts significantly influenced modern scholarship's pursuit and knowledge of early Christianity and Gnosticism. The contents of the codices were written in the Coptic language. Right, they call that the Coptic script on all these documentaries, right? The best known of these works is probably the Gospel of Thomas, of which the Nag Hammadi codices contain the only complete text. Spoiler alert, we're going to check out the Gospel of Thomas today. After the discovery, scholars recognized that fragments of these sayings attributed to Jesus appeared in manuscripts discovered at Oxyrhynicus in 1898. Probably butchered that name. There's like only one vowel in the whole word. I don't know what you guys want. And matching quotations were recognized in other early Christian sources. Subsequently, a first or second century date of composition circa 80, they have AD here, but we'll say CE, common era, or earlier, has been proposed for the lost Greek originals of the Gospel of Thomas. The buried manuscripts date from the 3rd and 4th centuries. They conclude here that the Nag Hammadi codices are currently housed in the Coptic Museum in Cairo, Egypt. So, fortunately, still in Egypt. Um... I'm going to I'm going to give you the Cliff's Notes version of the discovery. Okay. Two brothers discover it together in a cave in a jar in 1945. They were casting around looking for firewood or some crazy shit. Um they bring the jars home. They don't tell anybody they discover them for quite some time. Like the whole rest of that year. While they have those scripts, the whole stash at home, their mother who they lived with of course, is well aware that they're there. Doesn't really like them. She's a little scared, maybe because they're volatile, you know, potentially politically or religiously. She might have even thought they were cursed. We're not sure, but we do know that she did some damage in the form of burning several of the books entirely. <laughs> so she used them as the firewood that they were originally looking for. Uh, at some point, they, you know, figured out what she was doing and stopped her quickly before everything was lost. And then they still sat on them for a while, managed to, you know, bungle and not find a buyer, have a family feud about it, all sorts of uh, trouble internally. They eventually were sold by, I want to say, a brother-in-law, not even one of the brothers. Like, a brother-in-law ended up getting it sold. Um one or more of the codexes okay uh yeah okay so they left the they left the books with a with a coptic priest whose brother-in-law sold one of the codexes to the coptic museum in old cairo so that probably triggered a series of events which led to you know the museum and others coming out and seeking these guys out and and figuring out how to get the rest of what they still had so over time they slowly collected these back together into Cairo, but it took years, and it took years before they began to be understood for the, you know, level of importance that they were, and how old they truly were, and how faithful of a translation of, in the case of these books that we've got today that are so interesting to us, um, really were, especially because many of them directly informed books that were actually included in the canonical Bible. So, that's the, you know, that's the more or less the story of the discovery. I mean, it took until like the the mid 60s, no, the mid 70s to get Yeah, so they didn't have these books. They discovered them in 45 and they were not physically in the Coptic Museum as a whole group uh until 1975. So yeah, it took a while for these things to really 
begin to even get to a place where then they could be worked on by anything more than a handful of, you know, privately driven scholars, right, and uh, interpreted for the good of the world, if we can call it that, all right? Um, so, yeah, um, this is not a small collection. Uh, there are, like, over a thousand written pages. Um, that said, you know, so they have 11 complete books and fragments of two others in, in the remaining collection, those that didn't get burned. They haven't found any others in that area yet that I know of, although I do believe they're still looking to this day in that region. Um, I've read big chunks of these, though, already myself. Um, you can also hear uh, a lot of them in audio form. Again, YouTube is your friend. Uh, I'm going to include, again, I'll help you out. There'll be some links uh, to point you at in the show notes. Uh, we're going to go to our main big source next where you're going to, I'm going to mention them and we're going to see you have everything up to PDFs of the original documents uh, in the Coptic script if you want to look at the, uh, you know, the papyrus themselves. Um, what I was going to say there, though, is that, or what I'm trying to say is that these are, in my opinion, um, largely digestible and understandable, especially taken in chunks. So um, I really encourage you, if you're you know, interested at all after listening to this episode, to look into the Nag Hammadi texts yourself and you know, try to read a couple of them or, or passages from them. And uh, I, I think they're really interesting. So... Let's jump out of the wiki and get to the texts themselves. <clears throat> so, I do want to drop one last caveat or proviso or disclaimer in before we get into it. As I've already said, I'm, I'm more of a secular humanist than a, uh, you know, a, a faithful practicing believer uh, in this, you know, in Christianity. I can't put it any plainer. Uh, but I'm not here to denigrate ever, and I'm not here to, uh, you know, be some sort of critic of religion as a whole. Uh, if anything, I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm certainly not an apologist uh, for organized religion and everything that that means and embodies and has been responsible for over the years, good, bad, and ugly. Um, but as I said, for whatever reason, maybe because I'm scared for my immortal soul as my decaying meat sack slowly marches towards the sunset of my own brief existence. Um, it's a topic I, I'm interested in. So, uh, as I said, they remind me of other systems uh, that I've spent some time studying before. I know that there is said to be a time in the historical, if we're to believe the historical Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth you know, biographies account where he left for a large portion of his young adulthood and went, it was said, east. How far east, we do not know. Um, but came back as a full-blown man with the definite air of sainthood about him, uh, a.k.a. enlightenment, perhaps, by another name. Uh, so, you know, there's the, there's the little hook for me, right? Uh, let's check it out, though. All right, we're going to... What do we call this place? Gnosis.org. Forgive me, Gnosis.org. <coughs> Great one-stop shop for all your Nag Hammadi library needs. They probably have keychains in a gift shop somewhere over there for you. We're going to look at the Gospel of Thomas today, and being that there are actually 114 individual brief passages in this book, that amounts to a little longer read than I want to do at one chunk here with us for an introduction. So what I've decided to do is go ahead and 
take the first 33 of the parables in this book and we will simply read them together. And I do believe that in this first 33, we will get a great picture of the type of information that's in the rest of this codice and perhaps spark that little curiosity bone of yours to go and hunt down some more of these. I'm not ruling out the possibility of reading the remainder of these verses if people enjoy this episode enough. And now that I've damaged it already by releasing bad audio of it yesterday, I'm only hoping that in the long term, over the test of time, the newer file will eventually find its way to a lot more people's ears than those poor folks who were subjected to what I gave them yesterday. Begging your forgiveness, friends. So, let's relight my joint, which I have, as usual, managed to allow to go out because I'm yakking and not smoking. Let's adjust one last time our mic. And let us dip into the Thomas O. Lambden translation of the Gospel of Thomas part of the Nag Hammadi Library. These are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. I want to let you know that the Gospel of Thomas is said to be Thomas's first-hand account of sayings directly attributed to Jesus as related to him and a select few of the other original apostles. One. And he said, Whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. Two. Jesus said, Let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished and he will rule over the all. Three, Jesus said, if those who lead to you say to you, see, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. Four. Jesus said, the man old in days will not hesitate to ask a small child seven days old about the place of life, and he will live. For many who are first will become last and they will become one and the same. Five. Jesus said, Recognize what is in your sight, and that which is hidden from you will become plain to you. 
for there is nothing hidden which will not become manifest. 6. His disciples questioned him and said to him, Do you want us to fast? How shall we pray? Shall we give alms? What diet shall we observe? Jesus said, Do not tell lies, and do not do what you hate, for all things are plain in the sight of heaven. For nothing hidden will become, not become manifest. And nothing covered will remain without being uncovered. Seven. Jesus said, Blessed is the lion which becomes man when consumed by man. And cursed is the man whom the lion consumes, and the lion becomes man. I'm not convinced that the words don't need to be flipped around in that last sentence with the man becoming lion. Uh, so, this is where, as you'll see repeated again and again, there are parables, there are puzzles. Does this remind you of anything else you've ever read? Eight. And he said, The man is like a wise fisherman who cast his net into the sea and drew it up from the sea full of small fish. Among them, the wise fisherman found a fine, large fish. He threw all the small fish back into the sea and chose the large fish without difficulty. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Nine. Jesus said, Now the sower went out, took a handful of seeds, and scattered them. Some fell on the road. The birds came and gathered them up. Others fell on the rock, did not take root in the soil, and did not produce ears. And others fell on the thorns. They choked the seed, and worms ate them. And others fell on the good soil and it produced good fruit. It bore 60 per measure and 120 per measure. Ten. Jesus said, I have cast fire upon the world, and see, I am guarding it until it blazes. Eleven. Jesus said, This heaven will pass away, and the one above it will pass away. The dead are not alive, and the living will not die. In the days when you consumed what is dead, you made it what is alive. When you come to dwell in the light, what will you do? On the day when you were one, you became two. But when you become two, what will you do? Twelve. 
12. The disciples said to Jesus, We know that you will depart from us. Who is to be our leader? Jesus said to them, Wherever you are, you are to go to James the righteous, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Thirteen. Jesus said to his disciples, Compare me to someone, and tell me whom I am like. Simon Peter said to him, You are like a righteous angel. Matthew said to him, You are like a wise philosopher. Thomas said to him, Master, my mouth is wholly incapable of saying whom you are like. Jesus said, I am not your master. Because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring which I have measured out. And he took him and withdrew and told him three things. When Thomas returned to his companions, they asked him, What did Jesus say to you? Thomas said to them, If I tell you one of the things which he told me, you will pick up stones and throw them at me. And a fire will come out of the stones and burn you up. Fourteen. Jesus said to them, If you fast, you will give rise to sin for yourselves. And if you pray, you will be condemned. And if you give alms, you will do harm to your spirits. When you go into any land and walk about the districts, if they receive you, eat what they will set before you and heal the sick among them. For what goes into your mouth will not defile you, but that which issues from your mouth is that which will defile you. 15. Jesus said, When you see one who was not born of woman, prostrate yourselves on your faces and worship him. That one is your father. Sixteen. Jesus said, Men think, perhaps, that it is peace which I have come to cast upon the world. They do not know that it is dissension which I have come to cast upon the earth. Fire, sword, and war. For there will be five in a house, three will be against two, and two against three. The father against the son, and the son against the father. And they will stand solitary. Seventeen. Jesus said, I shall give you what no eye has seen, and what no ear has heard, and what no hand has touched, and what has never occurred to the human mind. Eighteen. The disciples said to Jesus, Tell us how our end will be. Jesus said, Have you discovered then the beginning, that you look for the end? 
for where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and not experience death. Nineteen. Jesus said, Blessed is he who came into being before he came into being. If you become my disciples and listen to my words, these stones will minister to you. For there are five trees for you in paradise, which remain undisturbed summer and winter, and whose leaves do not fall. Whoever becomes acquainted with them will not experience death. Twenty. The disciples said to Jesus, Tell us what the kingdom of heaven is like. He said to them, It is like a mustard seed. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it falls on tilled soil, it produces a great plant and becomes a shelter for birds in the sky. Twenty-one. Mary said to Jesus, Whom are your disciples like? He said, They are like children who have settled in a field which is not theirs. When the owners of the field come, they will say, Let us have back our field. They will undress in the presence in their presence in order to let them have back their field and to give it back to them. Therefore I say, if the owner of a house knows that a thief is coming, he will begin his vigil before he comes and will not let him dig through into his house of his domain to carry away his goods. You then, be on your guard against the world. Arm yourselves with great strength, lest the robbers find a way to come to you, for the difficulty which you expect will surely materialize. Let there be among you a man of understanding. When the grain ripened, he came quickly with his sickle in his hand, and reaped it. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Twenty-two. Jesus saw infants being suckled. He said to his disciples, These infants being suckled are like those who enter the kingdom. They said to him, Shall we then, as children, enter the kingdom? Jesus said to them, When you make the two one, and when you make the inside like the outside, and the outside like the inside, and the above like the below, and when you make the male and the female one and the same, so that the male not be male, nor the female female. And when you fashion eyes in the place of an eye, and a hand in place of a hand, and a foot in place of a foot, and a likeness in place of a likeness, then will you enter the kingdom.
Have you ever thought that the government may be keeping secrets from us? Perhaps may even be in cahoots with secret, dark occulted groups that are bent on domination of the human race. Hi, I'm Bones. And I'm Tubbs. And together we're the Bones, the Bones and Tubbs Podcast. Podcast. A weekly podcast dedicated to helping uncover the hidden truth of the deep state and the dark occult. We also like to help shine light on those warriors of truth that have dedicated their life's work to enlightening and bettering humanity. Join us every Thursday as we travel down a different rabbit hole. And try to discover the dirty secrets that they don't want you to know about. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Beyond Pod, and many other podcatchers. And don't forget to like and follow Bones and Tubbs on Facebook and Instagram. Or check out our website, www.bonesandtubs.com. The truth is out there for all of us to discover. And we plan on doing it, one, one episode, episode at, at a time. time. And thank you, Bones and Tubbs, for helping us come on back up out of the Gospel of Thomas. I decided after not too much deliberation there as I was eyeing our timer for the day, for the episode, that... Uh, we would go ahead and call it right there at 22 verses for a start. I think what I want to do is come back to this topic next week. We'll roll right in with the remaining 10 verses that we intended to cover initially, 11 here, and talk not only a little bit more about our thoughts and reflections on it at that time collectively, because I'm going to give us some time to have that dialogue online between now and then, as well as touch upon perhaps some other interesting aspects of the impact of the texts, maybe take a peek at another, um, because as we like to do, we realize that as the closer you look, the more there is to look at the more there is to learn about all these topics. So, that's the plan of record for now. We'll see how closely we stick to it. We have a number of other stories we're tracking presently. Uh, high up on the list are some cannabis industry type topics, uh, and that's like big picture landscape stuff, the the widespread overvaluing of cannabis companies in the marketplace on the one hand and then being shorted um, in terms of stock value on the other hand by leading, you know, pundits of uh, and indicators, uh, bellwethers of the uh, marketplace for, in a lot of cases, good reason uh, because a lot of the cannabis industry hype right now is kind of vaporware in a lot of places and in a lot of ways and with a lot of folks, um, you know, and not... Not to remotely act like I can call out anybody about anything. I don't know anything specifically right now about most most of these companies other than a couple of one, uh, Canadian ones that might be in the headlines. We'll get there. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about Bear and Monsanto and their plans for the cannabis industry, Coca-Cola and their plans for a CBD and recovery energy beverage type product. Um... I don't want to say I predicted this because lots of people have been talking about this kind of stuff, but we have been talking about this stuff, haven't we? Uh, on the show. Yes, we have. So, interesting times, as always. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I really enjoyed uh, remixing it for you. I hope this is going to be a much more listenable episode. I'm going to decide right now how to put this out. Do I just slam it right out as a, another episode after 55 and say listen to this one instead? Is that perhaps the clearest thing to do? The most transparent? Uh, would it even help uh, be listened to more uh, than if I tried to go and like replace the file? I don't think it's going to be replaced on anybody's devices who's already downloaded it. So a lot of folks, I feel like I'm sad to say, might be stuck with the old file. You need to understand that about how our interwebs work that way with, with respect to my feed. But I think, you know, it's a done deal once you've downloaded it, unless you delete that episode, which you could try to do. Um, but if you're listening to this, then that probably happened anyway, or 
you're downloading this at some later point in time. So we'll see how it goes. I don't know. We'll learn about technology together every day, even though we're using it every day. All right, you guys. Have a great week. Looking forward to sitting down with you again soon. You know what to do. Smoke that indica. Do shit anyway.